All right, so what I want to introduce here is um, it's a uh, statistical technique for we, we can produce a lot of models theoretically that give us you know, different, we can fit different moments of asset prices. Um, so the, but I think the real challenge is how to, how to test these models against the data. So I want to introduce sort of a, a statistical method for testing models against the data where you actually sort of produce, like I, I can produce nice graphs of like price predictions of what the S&P 500 should have looked like over the last 100 years given a model. And uh, just compare that and see how well we do. Just to give us sort of a different perspective in like, you know, did we do a good job in 1972 as opposed to 1994? Um, so, so this is a statistical approach for solving models, and it's sort of um, theory neutral in that if you can cast a model in a certain form, like, so it doesn't require any particular theoretical stance other than your ability to cast a model in a certain form to solve the model. So I think it actually would be a good application for this, these kinds of, uh, like the kind of models we're talking about here because you could test the models against the data, putting in these different effects such as learning and things like that. So the basic thing is I just, the only thing I need, and this is for asset pricing models, the only thing I need is you need to be able to write down a stochastic discount factor that depends on some observable exogenous state variables. So if you have a discount factor that depends on something that you can't observe, then I, I can't help you because it's statistical. I need to have stuff that you can observe. But once you have that, um, I can sort of solve the model statistically. So, and, so the existence of a stochastic discount factor is a pretty weak condition. Right? Plenty of models you can recast where there's a stochastic discount factor. Um, so what's nice about it is, so, so this is model free, right? You, given that in these rather weak conditions you can produce one of these discount factors, um, you can proceed. So it, it just follows from the existence of there's no arbitrage. So if you have a thing where there's no, there are no assets that are the same, that have multiple prices, then theoretically generally there exists a stochastic discount factor. There's some technical conditions, but I don't think that they really bite in practice. Um, normally, the stochastic discount factor is taken to depend on just aggregate consumption. Like the standard CRA model that we've already, people have mentioned a couple times, um, the only thing that matters is aggregate consumption. So if you know sort of the time series of aggregate consumption and how that's correlated with everything else, you can price everything. Um, but there's nothing necessary about that. You could write down stochastic discount factors that depend on um, investor sentiment or animal spirits or anything. As long as it's, you can relate it to some observable data, you could apply this technique. Um, so just sort of a refresher, or maybe this is new for some people. So a stochastic discount factor is just, you can write a price as a uh, weighted um, expectation. So let's say you have an asset that pays off tomorrow or n some fixed period now. Like say, say you have a um, one month T-bill. Um, there exists a, a, a random variable M so that the, the price today is the possible payoffs tomorrow multiplied by M, the expectation of that. And then for a long-lived asset like a stock, which exists forever, you, instead of getting something quite so simple, you get a recursive relationship. So the price today is sort of a discounted sum of possible um, prices plus the payoffs in the next period. No, I'm not. M is some random variable, and I'm not saying anything about it. Um, I have to, I'll need to be able to, you have to give me like a functional form for M. So it could depend on any state variables you have. But I don't make any assumptions about beyond that. The the yes, there should be a T subscript. That is a good point. Um, so if you give me a SDF where you, where you have sort of a parametric formulation of it, so it can't, M can't be unknown. It's given to you by theory. Um, then I introduce a statistical method, which is it's distribution free. So you can solve you can write you can solve a model like this where you write down say specifications for everything. Like a CRA model, you'd write down a specification where consumption growth is log normal or something like like that. Some specific distributional assumption. Um, my method is distribution free. So I just sort of do it. I just take the time series of consumption or whatever your variables are, and I go from there. Um, and the method doesn't use price information. So, so it produces prices as an output. It doesn't take prices as an input. And I'll talk about what I mean by that more later. So what's nice about that is I can actually compare sort of the price predictions against the actual prices you see and see how well a model does. Um, 
So the way it works is um, it's actually not very complicated and it has rather the flavor of GMM. So I'll talk about the relationship with the usual GM, GMM literature. Um, so the SDF, it implies some conditional moment equation. So you can rewrite both of those equations as for the short-lived asset, you have a conditional moment. Um, uh, P is just the discount factor times D. Um, and for a long-lived asset, you have P. So you have P today and P tomorrow. So P occurs twice, but still you get a conditional moment equation in a very simple form. Um, so now if M and the, uh, the payoffs are some function of some state variables, so you need some explicit list of like what are the state variables you're going to use, um, then just you can see from the form of it that P has to be a, uh, some unknown function of the state variable. So if you solve that conditional moment equation, which in practice is hard um, to solve exactly, but if you could solve it, you would have p as a function of state variables. Um, so, and in practice, we can't actually solve this exactly, except in very special cases, like maybe log utility. Um, so I just approximate it. I like let f be some linear combination of f sub i's, where f sub i's I choose. Now, if I choose a rich enough family of f sub i's, then I can approximate an arbitrary f. So in some sense, the only restriction here is to get a good, good approximation, I need enough data. So I need more data to do a better approximation. But beyond that, there's not really a restriction on f. Um, so what people normally do at this point is they write down some conditional distribution for the state variables, and then they solve it using some numerical method. So but what I do instead is, uh, so we, I just want to find an f that satisfies my conditional moment equations, where F can occur today and tomorrow. Or in the short-lived asset, it just occurs today. Um, so I can't really solve this as it is. So what I do is I just multiply um, this through by F, F sub i, the basis functions, and I take the expectation. So once I do that, I get n equations and n unknowns. And it actually turns out to be linear because my stochastic discount factors are linear in prices. So, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, there should, there should be f sub i here. So this is a linear sum of f, the f sub i's. This is a single f sub i, so for each i. Yeah, yeah. That's what I get for editing my slides last night. Um, so this, if, you, if you're familiar with GMM, this actually sort of resembles GMM. GMM, you have some conditional moment equation. You multiply through by instruments, and then you set the expectation, the unconditional expectation multiplying by the instruments to be 0. Um, but the difference here is, so GMM, you would actually take the time series of prices, and you choose parameters so that the observed prices um, make the conditional moment equation 0. Here, I don't use the price information at all. F is just some function. The thing I saw for is the a sub i's. The, the thing that gives me the prices is a function of the state variables. So now prices is an output. So if you, once I solve the model and you give me the time series of state variables, I can tell you the time series of prices. I just plug in with my A sub i's. Um, so this gives me a time series of predictions I, I, can, I can just compare. Like if you give me a specific model, including the parameters, I can just graph what it should have looked like. Um, or if you put parameters in there, I can choose the parameters to minimize the pricing errors historically. I'll give examples of both. Um, so sort of the standard um, GE asset pricing model is where everyone has CRA utility. And here, the stochastic discount factor is um, beta times the, the growth rate of consumption to a power. Um, so I'm, gonna give an I'm just going to solve the model for this, where I'm going to take S&P 500 prices and dividends and aggregate consumption data. I'm just going to take. Schiller has data that goes back to 1889. I'm just going to use that. And I'm going to approximate this um, price function as a third degree polynomial in the growth rate in consumption and dividends. And I find that actually going to higher order doesn't improve the accuracy very much. So this model is not very curved. Um, and I, I just picked numbers 0.99 for beta, which means people are pretty patient, and gamma 3, which means people are somewhat risk averse. Um, but not like some insane levels that you see sometimes in the literature. Um, so the black is the data. 
and the red is the predictions. So you can see now, if I could cut off the graph here, this would look like a pretty successful model, right? Up until about World War II, you know, you see sort of deviations from the model, but the model picks up a lot of swings. All right, so the model sees that prices are going to, predicts prices are low here and they're low here. Um, the, the model predicts as prices recover here and they recover. So the swings match up until about World War II. So now these are, now, so if, if someone had, if you could apply this technique and he's written in 1947, there wouldn't have, no one would have thought there was an equity premium puzzle, I think, just because this is a pretty good fit. But then after World War II, it goes horribly wrong. So after World War II, what happens is that consumption and dividends before World War II are, are pretty volatile, and that they lead to volatile prices, and the model predicts volatile prices. After World War II, consumption and dividends aren't very volatile, and prices become even more volatile. This is, I guess this is the price-dividend ratio I'm graphing here, the log price-dividend ratio. Um, so there are gigantic swings that you just don't see in the um, aggregate data, but you see in the price data. So, but this is sort of, this is an old model. This goes back to um, Lucas 1979, if not before. So we have many more high-tech models. Maybe it's just a failure of how simple this model is. So I consider one of the leading mo models that people feel really solves this problem, which is this Campbell Cochran external habit model, which a couple of people have mentioned um, over the course of the two days. Here, the stochastic fi discount factor has an extra S variable. Um, that S variable is a very complicated nonlinear function of prior consumption, or prior consumption growth. Um, and it's clearly reverse engineered simply to better match the data. But now, Campbell and Cochran, when they wrote their paper, they matched, they picked some moments, they assume the consumption growth is log normal. Um, and uh, they sort of solve it to match certain moments. So they, they match like the price dividend ratio and the um, expected return and things like that. So the S is not really economically motivated. You can sort of think of it as it, resemble, it represents some level of external habit where you get used to a certain level of consumption. And if you go, go below that, you're really unhappy and it shows up in stock prices. But it doesn't have a very clear motivation. Um, so, and as Albert mentioned, if you, if you take this model and you try to work out what's the implied risk aversion in this, it implies a risk aversion of, of 80. I want to go back, actually. So now, so this is, I made uh, gamma 3. So maybe, like, so people suggested that maybe for this model, gamma has to be gigantic. Like, I think in one of Mary Prescott's papers, they suggest 55. Now, the effect of increasing gamma is it just actually pulls, it increases the volatility of prices, but it pushes the pulls the price down. So if you like gamma of four, you'll be below the entire time series of observed prices. Um, and this shows up when you look at the, the external habit model. I consider several, there's several estimates in the literature. Um, so black is the data. Yellow is uh, the uh, Campbell Cochran parameterization. And actually, sorry, it doesn't show up that well. But it's, it's down here. So the implied risk aversion of 80 means that every single period, stock, the stock market was overvalued. So if you had an applied risk aversion that high, you would not buy stock because you think it is insanely expensive. Um, so I consider some other, I take another um, estimate from the literature, Tellerini and Zhang, which is a GMM estimate. It, and that's the green one. It does better, um, but you, can see, you still see you get some gigantic deviations from the true data. And then I was curious at that point if, Maybe this is driven by, like, is there something wrong with the model itself? Like, maybe there's no choice of parameters that produce anything matching the prices you see. So I just sort of brute force, did a brute force search to see if you choose the different parameters in the model, can you match the average prices? And uh, the red and the blue are the examples here. And you, you can match the level of prices, but once you do that, you have to give up your ability to match the big swings. So this here, you see big swings here. So you need to generate big swings to match the equity premium. You need big, or the, the volatility of stock prices. This gives you big swings, but the big swings don't really match up with um, big swings in the prices. So you just sort of get it as a moment, but it doesn't match up in the time series. And then if you try to match up the time series, then you have to give up the big swings. 
And then I was curious, so in line with uh, the, the conference, I was just interested in like how can you do if you put in just some sort of investor sentiment variable. Um, the one I'm most familiar with is, uh, so this is basically an empirical paper, Baker and Wergler, they, have, they just have a measure of investor sentiment. They take a bunch of time series puzzles um, and then they say that if, this, if the time series puzzle is large, then um, investor sentiment is high, investors have high animal spirits, something like that. And if, if it's low, then they, then they have low. And they just take, they take some things like one is the closed end discount puzzle, which is uh, there are certain mutual funds which um, it suggests there's an arbitrage opportunity uh, between buying, a, you can buy a closed end mutual fund or buy the stock. Um, there's an arbitrage op opportunity that people don't seem to take advantage of. That's a measure of investor sentiment. And they have a couple of similar ones to that. Um, and then they just take a principal component analysis to produce a time series. Um, sorry. So, and then they have empirical evidence that in cross-secting, you can explain some of the anomalies in cross-secting. So, to look at it here, I just want to put it in the stochastic discount factor. So, I just take this S measure. Um, I orthogonalize it to consumption so that everything that should be attributed to consumption is consumption. So there's a missing minus gamma here. You're about to catch me on. And uh, so I have, uh, so it's just A times S. So S is this measure of consumption. Um, and I, so this is, and I didn't really know what to expect from this, right? And it would help, if it would help in the time series. Um, it's sort of a short time series compared to the, the full range of data. So the best fit is you get beta 0.98, which is people are pretty, um, pretty patient. Um, a gamma of 1.12, which is a totally reasonable level of risk aversion. Everyone would be happy if we could produce that. Um, and then the weight on the sentiment, is, I don't have an interpretation for the magnitude. Um, so I look at, so the red is uh, the, the Baker-Wergler measure. So the black is the data. The red is the Baker-Wergler measure. And you can see it picks up some of the action in the data. It picks up this big drop in the price dividend ratio here. It picks the recovery. And then sort of when you get to the NASDAQ bubble, the, the big jump here in the NASDAQ bubble, it sort of doesn't really pick up on that. But sort of before the NASDAQ bubble, it offers a, a clear improvement. And then the blue is if I take their, the beta and gamma and leave out and set A to be 0, essentially. And you can see that's actually much too smooth. And the price level historically is much too high. Because the suggested price level, the massive price level, you need gamma of around three. But it does seem in this window where the uh, data is valid, it does sort of seem to pick up something about how investors are evaluating stock prices. Um, so some extensions I have in mind is, uh, so I can fit lots of models here. I've been taking notes of like potential candidates for models that fit like this. Things that would work is uh, you could have agents where they have the beliefs are simply incorrect. Like there's a representative agent with incorrect beliefs. You could have, um, it wouldn't be how to adapt it to, they have heterogeneous beliefs. So there are multiple agents. Um, you have learning. In all these cases, you can explicitly write down a stochastic discount factor, so it's tractable. Um, other things you could try is different utility functions. Like I, I've looked at internal habit, which doesn't actually particularly help compared to CRA. Um, Epstein Zinn is a candidate. Um, I'm looking at some other assets, such as looking at long-run bonds. How well do, you, do we price long-run bonds? Um, and I'm thinking of ways of actually looking at the cross-section rather than time series. So look at, we're looking at one single dividend series. There's clearly more than one single dividend series out there that we can extract from the cross-section. So that's just some stuff I'm working on, and that's it.